I'll just let him get up here and do something. So, my sermon this evening is not in turning points. There is nothing like a, having a good repository and keeping a good lookout, not waiting at home for things to fall into the lap, but prowling about like a wolf for the prey. Those words, um, lines from a letter that our principal founder, Jeremy Belknap, wrote in 1795, should serve as an anthem for the historical society um, and really um, be um, how we look forward as we celebrate our 225th anniversary, our quasquis bicentennial, if you prefer, and I hope you don't. Um, but um, I know that some of you have seen the exhibition, but let me remind you of how it's laid out and explain what we've tried to do upstairs who, for those who haven't. And that is we've selected 15 um, objects and documents from our collection. That's 15 of more than 13 million pages of documents um, to show um, turning points in American history, not all the important crisis or turning points in American history, but where in our collections we have um, an eyewitness account of the event or the record kept by the principal figure or figures in that event. Um, so um, um, we have also put our exhibition starting at the head of the stairs in reverse chronological order so that we have um, start with um, something we just commemorated a few days ago, and that is um, the 9-11 attacks. And the immediate aftermath of that event, our then director, William Fowler, queried the members and fellows of the Historical Society and asked them to reflect upon what um, that is. Was this going to be a turning point in American history and what did it mean? So we have people, we've collected people's reflections in the immediate aftermath. They're wonderful, thoughtful, uh, well found, um, thought out and written, um, often drawing upon um, other events in American history, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, the entry into the First World War. But in the case of Susan and George Lodge, they not only wrote out a thoughtful account of um, 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 this event, but they were that day, the day of the attack, sailing in a small sailboat through New York Harbor. So they were also eyewitnesses to that. So that's where our exhibition begins and then moves very rapidly, again in reverse order, through the adjoining exhibition rooms back to the founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. This is the first page of John Winthrop's account of the founding of Massachusetts. This is when the ship Arbella is about to sail for America. Within the exhibition, we've put mute witnesses to events from the past, artifacts on display. In this case, a sample, a Wampanoag artifact um, at the time of its acquisition in the early 19th century, thought to be a trophy from King Philip's wigwam at the end of King Philip's war, the demise of King Philip, Metacomet. Um, probably not um, what it was purported to be, but um, certainly a 17th century Native American artifact, domestic artifact, and therefore very rare. Um, in addition to the 15 objects in our exhibition, we also last spring um, had our own version of March Madness, where uh, members of the staff selected 64 uh, documents and artifacts from our collection and had an online uh, contest uh, um, between them. And our final selection was, I was about to say of course, but was the extraordinary letter that um, Abigail Adams writes to husband John away at the Continental Congress in March of 1776, reminding him to remember the ladies. So this is the bonus uh, in addition to our exhibition. So what is not in um, our Turning Points exhibition? Um, 
For one thing, we do have no materials about the Declaration of Independence. We showed them here uh, this spring as part of our Jefferson exhibition, and in fact, they're all boxed up to go to the Virginia Historical Society in a few days, where they're only on temporary loan and will soon return, but also will be displayed next spring at the New York Historical Society. Not showing um, the Declaration of Independence, um, uh, um, surely a turning point, shows how complicated this can be. And in not showing uh, Jefferson, we lose the opportunity to show his pocket account book kept in the um, uh, spring and summer of 1776 in Philadelphia. And I know it's hard to see from where you are, but if you read down through it, you'll see that on July 4th, Thomas Jefferson went shopping and bought a thermometer and some women's gloves and gave a little money and charity. From here on out, I'm going to very rapidly move through a number of slides. This is like an eye examination where I'm going to move so fast you'll think that your eyeballs are being pulled out of your head. I'm also going to do that thing that the ophthalmologist does and say, do you prefer A or B? <laughs> so. When we think about the end of slavery in Massachusetts, the anti-slavery crusade here, um, is it uh, the selling of Joseph, the first anti-slavery pamphlet published here in New England, a unique surviving copy uh, written by Samuel Sewell, whose papers are here. So is it the selling of Joseph, or Justice William Cushing's notes in the Quack Walker case in the 1780s that ended, effectively ended slavery in Massachusetts? Well, it's neither, because we've decided to show you the emancipation pen, the pen Lincoln used to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, and this pushed that theme um, in a different direction. And showing for the period of the Civil War and the coming of the Civil War, the Emancipation Proclamation pen and um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's description of finishing writing Uncle Tom's Cabin, we left little space for the Civil War itself. So not on display is um, an extraordinary letter um, written by this man, Wilder Dwight, the commander of um, the Second Massachusetts Infantry, who writes to his mother um, in Sharpsburg um, on September 17th, um, 1862, uh, an event that we know here in the North, uh, more familiarly, is uh, the Battle of Antietam. He begins this letter writing about the misty, moisty morning and goes on, and you'll see about three quarters of the way uh, down the page, he's terribly wounded, so completes this letter lying on the battlefield, mortally wounded, completes this letter to his mother. The dark spots, you see this, and on the second page are his own blood. Um, and he, the, at the top of the second page, in this scrawl that his handwriting um, becomes, he writes, I think I die in victory. That is, that the, even though he's been left behind between the lines in the battlefield, that it will be a Union victory. And in fact, it is that Union victory that allows Lincoln to go ahead and um, um, proclaim the Emancipation Proclamation. Also, we have almost no space to show anything to do with the recruiting of African-American soldiers in the North during the Civil War, an extraordinarily important event, um, and also um, where there are wonderful materials in our collection. Um, also, in showing Abraham Lincoln's role in the Emancipation Proclamation, it forces us to put aside uh, one of the most extraordinary stories told in an exchange of letters in our collection, and that is the letters exchanged by Abraham Lincoln and Edward Everett on November 20th, 1863, the day after they both spoke at Gettysburg and the consecration of the Gettysburg um, Cemetery. Um, uh, Everett returned to Washington with Lincoln, sat down and wrote to him the next day, uh, um, and this is his letter book copy of the letter he wrote to Lincoln, um, telling Lincoln that he wished that in two hours, Everett was the great order of the 19th century, but that in two hours he had been able to accomplish what Lincoln did in two minutes. Lincoln writes this very 
um, kind letter in reply saying, oh, no, no, we each did the part. I'm flattered that you thought that I was at all successful. In any case, another um, extraordinary document put aside. Sometimes we have to make um, um, hard decisions. Here is a letter in the exhibition. This is Octave Chanute, a civil engineer, a mentor to the Wright brothers, writing to aviation enthusiasts here in Boston, um, in this case Samuel Cabot, informing um, him that the Wright brothers had successfully flown and describing the flight, the details and engineering details of the, the um, uh, uh, first powered aircraft and the flights. Um, we had to choose between showing this letter and a letter written by um, Samuel Cabot's twin brother just a couple of weeks later where um, Godfrey Lowell Cabot writes um, a, a letter that he wants forwarded to President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, telling Roosevelt that, that the government should pay attention to aviation. There was very little popular interest in the Wright brothers' early flights, but it's um, the Cabot brothers here in Boston and other aviation enthusiasts who had the insight that this was an extraordinary event. So um, uh, Godfrey Lowell Cabot, who later on became an aviator in his own right, flew for the Navy in the First World War. There was a time when I thought the fact that he had learned to fly when he was 50 meant that I had a sort of endless future be before me to start something new. Um, in fact, I, the reason that this letter, that the Chanute letter rather than this letter is in the exhibition has to do with the address line. It may be hard to see from where you are, but it's addressed to the Honorable Henry Cabot Lodge, senator from Massachusetts. And the reason uh, we resisted using this letter is it would be side by side with a letter that Theodore Roosevelt, that's on display upstairs, that Theodore Roosevelt wrote to Henry Cabot Lodge, telling him to go to the president, informing him of um, that the forces in Cuba in 1898, after the Battle of San Juan Hill, were in um, measurable distance of a great military disaster. So and um, our concern was that our exhibition would in fact turn into um, transitional moments in American history as viewed by the Lodge family. <laughs> and this meant that we couldn't use this photograph. This is Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., um, Senator Lodge's grandson, who had also been a senator from Massachusetts, uh, speaking with um, Mio um, Ninh Dien, uh, the president of South Vietnam. When I met Henry Cabot Lodge in the 1980s, right in this room, I felt, except for the white suit, I felt exactly as um, <laughs> GM did. He just loomed up over everyone else in, in the room. It's also the case um, that we have things that are wonderful, but they're not in the turning point exhibition because they weren't turning points. And an example of this is um, this um, um, broadside telling uh, people how in, here in the Back Bay of Boston the victory parade to celebrate um, vote for women's suffrage in 1915 would be laid out. It was such an enormous parade that as if you look at it closely you can see it had to go back and forth up and down the streets of the Back Bay to get everybody marching all at the same time. In fact when in the vote in uh, 1915, s women's suffrage lost by two to one. Four years later, um, uh, Massachusetts was very quick to ratify the um, amendment to the Constitution, but in fact, the victory celebration was a disaster for the women's suffrage movement. Um, also, um, because Henry Cabot Lodge and the lodges are everywhere, um, here's another example of um, a turning point that was not a turning point. In this case, these, this is a photograph from the senatorial election in 1952 where um, uh, Lodge, an incumbent popular senator from Massachusetts, ran against young congressman John F. Kennedy, and they're shown together when they debated. 
And um, this election, the story of this election, and it's been told by historians in this room, is that um, the election was very close, but that Lodge lost because he would not turn to support from Senator Joseph McCarthy. He re re refused to look for um, McCarthy's endorsement and lost this close election. Um, the story's a complicated one, and we can show it in documents from Lodge's papers, but the document that's not a turning point is this is a draft of a speech in the Lodge papers written for McCarthy to deliver um, on Lodge's behalf. So in, this story is complicated, and they went right up to the precipice before deciding not to seek this endorsement. In other instances, we have, to we have to decide an emphasis. In the uh, uh, Leverett Saltonstall papers, we have displayed um, his record of the atomic bomb tests in 1946 in the um, Pacific at the Bikini Atoll. Um, um, so we have essentially materials from the beginning of the atomic age. Um, less than 20 years later, this is a telegram from Secretary of State Dean Rusk um, congratulating um, um, Saltonstall for his efforts on behalf of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So if um, um, we have the beginning of the atomic age in the first test after the Second World War, we have the beginnings of the control of nuclear weapons in the 1960s, both in the same collection. And because when you set out in this line, you so sort of end up going down the path of archival madness, um, you start trying to sort of take favorite things from the collection and fit them into your uh, exhibition. And I was tempted, the devil was whispering in my ear about putting, this is the guest book that Governor Leverett Saltonstall kept at the State House. Um, during the period he was governor and during the Second World War, and it's hard to see from wh where you're sitting, but the names at the bottom are all members of the Von Trapp family who have come to America as refugees from Europe and signed in at the guest book of the um, uh, State House. It's, it's almost impossible to imagine in the world we walk around in where uh, who, people who are um, soon to be enemy aliens are invited to come as guests to the State House in Massachusetts. And um, um, I'll just go right by another Lodge photograph that's our favorite. Uh, uh, this is a wonderful Larry Burroughs photograph that I think shows him in a different light. Many of you know that I tend to end my talks by ringing the Liberty Bell, a bell that contains um, uh, Garrisonian inscriptions, um, um, uh, supposedly kept to warn um, people that slave hunters were loose in Boston, but um, uh, a wonderful artifact from our collection. I thought Ann Bentley, our curator, was going to be here this evening, so I didn't dare ring it. Um, but um, at the end, what I'd like to encourage you to do is think about this exhibition as you go through it, and we have at the end of it um, a sort of rudimentary suggestion box where we're encouraging people to suggest other things that we might think of in terms of turning points. And last but not least, as you leave this evening, I encourage you to salute the portrait of Jeremy Belknap that hangs out in the lobby just to the left of the doorway, um, uh, thinking of him, of us as um, but our members, fellows, and donors having um, created a collection for which we have, I think, built truly a good repository. Or um, when you're upstairs, lace, raise a glass in celebration of what we have um, here before us. Thank you.